to them sisters, allies, and loved ones. Welcome to another episode of As Told by Charles Women, an oral history series that aims to usher our stories into the permanent archives of global history where they have always belonged. I'm your host, Joby Tyson, and the founder of Tudum Global, a multimedia platform for childless women. And when I first envisioned this series, I knew I wanted to take an active role in documenting the narrative of involuntary childless women and the childless experience. As a researcher, I know too well that archives have the power to preserve community memory and influence individual identity. Today's episode gives a voice to turning pain into power. Behind every woman, there's one hell of a story. And today we have Dana. Dana's our guest hailing from Kentucky. Hey, Dana, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, thanks for having me. Absolutely. First, just go ahead and introduce yourself to the audience. So my name is Dana Mohan, and my husband and I uh, went through 10 years of infertility. And so after the last procedure ended in 2017, I wrote a book, uh, a, a memoir called Inconceivable, about our experiences. It's currently, I am currently looking for a, an, um, an agent, rather. I'm going to try and go the traditional route on the book mm -hmm. first. If not, then I'll publish it myself. Um, so... Um, anyway, so I have created a, a platform. I started to create a platform with Instagram and, and things like that and building a blog. But I want to get my experiences out there because my experiences are um, a little more than what people are used to hearing. And it's somewhat shocking, I believe. Okay, so let's delve a little into it. As usual with these conversations, I like to start from the beginning. So as best as you can, can you just walk us through your story from the beginning? Yes, sure. So um, my husband and I met in 2007 and we dated for a couple of years. And at that time I was 27 and he was 32 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, once we decided that we were going to get married, we knew right away that we wanted kids. So actually we started trying to have a baby before our wedding and our wedding, we got married in uh, 2009, September. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't happening. And so after our wedding, I decided, you know, we've been trying for a little while. It's been six months or so. Mm -hmm. And I was reading, you know, all these things, you know, like people do whenever it's taking a little longer, you start then to get on the internet, you know? Mm -hmm. So I was getting on the internet and reading a lot of things and realizing, oh, you know, I am getting a little older and maybe I should be talking to someone about how long it's taking because I haven't had a single positive pregnancy test. So anyway, to make a, make a long story a little shorter, I went to see um, a specialist and um, he's right away was, you know, asking me all these great questions and I was feeling really good about it. I thought, all right, you know, I was sitting there in front of him thinking this is going to be it. He's going to look at me. He's going to say, I'm going to do this. It's going to be fine. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm thinking in my head by the end of this year, I'm going to be pregnant. Mm -hmm. um, especially after being at my GYN and she literally told me, no, 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 you don't have anything wrong with you because you don't have any symptoms of anything. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I explained to my, my specialist what it was I was experiencing and he right away started to think, you know, I might have some uh, endometriosis because my, I explained that my sister had stage four removed um, and that my aunt had issues getting pregnant and my mom had some issues getting pregnant. So right away he was jumping in mm -hmm. fast forward, you know, all the things that happened. I'm in my specialist. I'm seeing him for IUI. I see him for my first IVF. Mm -hmm. And then he delivers to me the worst news I had, could ever experience. I literally, in my book, I call it the, wor the worst day of my life. Mm -hmm. um, so much so that the, uh, the news was so shattering. I literally had an out-of-body experience. It but, um, once that happened, we decided that we were going to get a second opinion. So we went to another doctor and it was in another state, another city. And so I would drive three or four hours to go see him. And with him, I did three IVFs and he um, kept trying to do more and do more and do more. And before I knew it, I realized, and my husband realized that 
hmm, this doesn't seem right. More like we were being taken advantage of mm -hmm. um, because, you know, it's easy to do when you want something so badly, you, yeah. you're just willing to do anything you can to get it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we left him. I went to another specialist, but was even further away. Um, mm -hmm. Went through two IVFs, a gestational carrier, an egg donor um, with him. So in total, to sum everything up, I had three fertility related surgeries during that time frame of the 10 years that my husband and I experienced infertility treatments. I had 11 or 12 total miscarriages and I did lose count because toward the mm -hmm. end, uh, getting pregnant was not a joy to me. It was actually a, a burden because I knew I was going to lose it. Yeah. Um, I had two foiled adoption attempts. So even going through IVF and then end up in, not ending up with a baby and even trying to adopt doesn't always work out. It didn't mm -hmm. work out twice for us. Um, then I had eight total IVF procedures. Like I said before, I tried an, a gestational carrier. I tried an egg donor. I had three total IUI procedures, two with injectables. So that would be like medications, injectable medications, mm -hmm. and one with Clomid. And then I had three rounds of Clomid alone. So we have been through literally all that science can offer in the fertility world. And we are childless. And um, to put it bluntly, that completely knocked me to my knees. Yeah. And for a really long time, I did not realize how low I was because I created a codependency with my husband and everybody around me. I was just, I was trying to make up for my lack of, and you can fill in the blank there, my mm -hmm. lack of being able to have children, my lack of feeling like I'm not contributing to the family, my lack my, uh, my, my fault in letting my family down, my in-laws down. My husband is Indian and his parents are uh, first uh, first generation immigrants from India. Mm -hmm. So his culture is so strong in, you know, having a baby and marriage. Like marriage is one of the most, the biggest event that you can have in an Indian life. So, yeah. um, and then after that is having a baby and, with my husband being the oldest grandchild, not just on one side, but on both sides of the family, he is actually looked up as a leader in the family. And his baby was expected to take that role when he was to pass. Mm -hmm. So um, when we didn't have a baby, mm -hmm. that all fell on me yeah. uh, as well. So I was dealing with the infertility. I was dealing with all the emotions. I was dealing with the cultural situation, my own thing going on about not being a full woman. If I can't be here and do what my body is meant to do, what am I here for? You know, all the things, it was just more than I could handle. Yeah. We definitely all have those questions. Um, I just want to go back to some of the things sure. that you said. I, um, I know it's in your book, but can you just give a little brief summary of what you consider your worst day ever? Yes. Yeah, so um, the doctor, and I might tear up, so I'm going to try my best to take a deep breath and, and get this out. So the doctor, after the first IVF I had, um, the eggs, he showed us our embryos and they were not of best quality. We mm -hmm. had some that were okay, but that his, his reply was I've implanted or I have transferred B mm -hmm. embryos before and they're the healthy babies. That's okay. what he said. Mm -hmm. And so when he, my husband and I heard that we both kind of knew right away that this, this isn't good, you know? So that was the day of the transfer. Mm -hmm. So when I didn't get pregnant with, that IVF, the doctor called us into the office and uh, sat us at an, like a, a big oval table. And he was at one end and his nurse practitioner was in another. And my husband and I were sitting across from each other. And he just blurts out, um, I don't think that you're ever going to be able to have children of your own. And the best way that you'd be able to have children is to either do a gestational carrier or adopt. 
Oh, wow. Just like that. Just like that. Uh -huh. And to me, what happened was there was no like, so how are you doing? There was mm -hmm. no buildup. You know, mm -hmm. the weather outside is so nice. You know, yeah. nothing. Mm -hmm. To me, it was as if someone had taken like two. It's I know the sound that it made because as soon as I heard it, I imagine that's what it was. It's like two pieces of wood, like a two by four, yeah. two two by fours going boom right mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. And it was right by my right ear. Yeah. And let me take a breath. Take your time. And when I heard that, um, everything else just stopped for me. And I didn't hear any more. They kept talking and I could see that my doctor's mouth was moving, but I couldn't hear anything he said. Mm -hmm. And so since I couldn't hear him, I was kind of like, I can't hear him, you know? So I, it was all in slow motion too. So I looked to the left of me at his um, nurse practitioner sitting at the bottom of the table and she was nodding her head and then her mouth would move, but I couldn't hear her either. Mm -hmm. And I never looked at my husband. I just completely turned. And then all of a sudden I was outside. Like I had left my body. Mm -hmm. I was outside in this tree and I can, the trees there, I can mm -hmm. point to it and say, that's the tree that I was in. Mm -hmm. But a sense of peace, just complete peace mm -hmm. came over me and I couldn't hear any, it's actually by um, a highway. Mm -hmm. I couldn't hear the traffic going by. All I could feel was just, just the gentle breeze. It was like 70 degrees in, in the springtime, you know, a nice cool breeze and the sun was shining. It was a beautiful day. And, um, the, just a small breeze. I could hear the leaves, the, what were on the tree. Cause it was just, you know, budding just a little bit of the sound and then little birds chirping. I can hear it right now. It's crazy mm -hmm. because and then I looked into the window and I saw myself sitting at the table, oh, Wow! but I had my hands in my lap and, but I looked frozen, mm -hmm. like just shock. Yeah. And I saw everybody, I saw the back of the, of my doctor. I saw my husband's like the side, the, the side view of him, his profile. And they were talking and I just thought to myself, gosh, it's so nice today. You know, I was completely mm -hmm. dis dis disconnected. Yeah. And then my husband reached across the table and he touched my hand and I was back in my body again. Mm -hmm. And then I could hear them talking yeah. and the, the doctor was talking, but I wasn't listening to him anymore. He completely lost me, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so when my husband reached over and touched my hand, he Sorry, just a second. No, take your time. It's like reliving it. So, yes. yeah. My husband reached over and touched my hand and, and just mouthed the words, don't worry, we'll fix it. Mm. So I, I pulled my hand back because I knew I wasn't going to be able to keep myself together. Mm -hmm. So I just sat up in my seat really tight and just kind of tightened everything up because otherwise I was just going to lose it. And mm -hmm. um, the doctor and his nurse got up and left and um, my husband came around the table and I said, I just don't think I want to do this anymore because yeah. we'd already been through the IUIs and, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And he said, don't make any decisions yet. We will. Let's think about it. Yeah. And then like, you know, I didn't speak all the way home. And when we got to the house, um, I, our garage was actually under the house. We actually walk into the basement and then walk up. So I walked in first and then I walked up and was sitting on the bottom step in the foyer of uh, the house. And he came to me and I just was, had my hands in my, my face in my hands. And he said, or I said to him, you didn't sign up for this. I know you want to be a dad and I know how badly you want to be one. 
I would understand if you wanted to in this now. Um, I said it would break my heart, but I would understand. Mm -hmm. And he, he raised my chin up to see his face and he said, I married you for you and children are only a bonus. Mm -hmm. So, That's but it cute. only got worse from there for me. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was the worst day of my life. Mm. So all of this, all of these events with the multiple miscarriages, the IVF, the failed adoptions, this was a span of how many years? 10. 10 years? Mm -hmm. Okay. Talk, talk. A lot of times, you know, we get unsolicited advice and of course we always hear, why don't you just adopt as one uh. of them and you, but you've tried more than once. What, what, tell us about that experience a little bit. So, um, you know, adoption, when you're talking about adoption and it not working out for you, it can be somewhat of a taboo conversation because mm -hmm. everyone has a certain, um, thought about adoption and, um, you don't want to step on their toes about it. But for my husband and I, when we decided that we were going to try adoption, we looked at our life and we said, what is it about a lot, our life that a child would bring to it? Mm -hmm. And what is it about our life that we could give to a child? So we really thought about this thing forward and backward. Mm -hmm. And um, the two attempts that we had, one was we found that we were being lied to by the first agency that we went through. So my husband and I, just while we were on the phone with them, getting ready to be matched with someone, we found that they were lying. Mm. And we just said, no, mm. no. No more. Uh, the parent, we had a very strict rule that we did not want the birth mother to had been taking drugs during mm -hmm. the present preg pregnancy. Mm -hmm. I felt like if I was going, the, the child being adopted was already going to have so much on his or her plate. Mm -hmm. I wanted them to be able to enter the world. Um, and, the best way that they possibly could. Okay. So um, we did not want the mother, the birth mother doing drugs. And we found out right before we were matched that she wasn't doing drugs all of her pregnancy. She was only doing drugs some of her pregnancy. And it wasn't like she was just like smoking, you know, mm -hmm. and that's not good either, yeah. but she was doing heroin and meth. Oh, wow. So, you know, we were, oh, it, it really hurt. Yeah. Um, so because we didn't trust them any longer, mm -hmm. we said no. Okay. So, and the second one, they were so far apart in time too. The first mm -hmm. adoption was, or their first adoption pro, uh, attempt was, um, so we started in 2000. My very first procedure was in 2010. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, 2000, hold on, let me back up. When I say procedure, so that was a, it was 2000, uh, 2009. Yeah, sorry. I'm not mm -hmm. sure that that even matters, but anyway. Yeah. So it was about three years into our trying that we decided maybe adoption is the way that we should go. So mm -hmm. it wasn't until like, maybe five years later mm -hmm. that we tried again, but okay. it went, but went a different route. Mm -hmm. And with this, what this one, um, we were almost, we were about to be matched and we were coming to, we had, we'd already been gone. We had already been going through the fertility situation for so long. And we had decided, you know what? I am just exhausted. And I said, I'm exhausted too. And I sat down and had a heart to heart with my husband and found out that really he was 
wanting to go through with the adoption because he thought I really wanted to go through with the adoption. Mm -hmm. And I was doing it because I thought he really wanted to go through it. Mm -hmm. I was okay with the life that we were. I wasn't okay with it at the time. You know, you got to move into it slowly, but I was ready to just get past this whole kid thing. I just wanted to put it to rest. And can we just get back to being married. I mean, we didn't even know what it was like to be married without yeah. infertility. Mm-hmm. So that's what we decided. We just like, you know what, let's just put this to bed. We w- were not willing to go through any more pain. I was emotionally, physically, mentally exhausted. Mm-hmm. And so was he. And it was actually starting to show up in my body um, physically the exhaustion and and the stress and the trauma and all the pain that I kept pushing down. And I'm still dealing with it today. I have to um, I actually go to the Cleveland clinic and uh, to Vanderbilt for different treatments to help mm-hmm. with um, some gut issues that uh, I have taken on because of all the stress and medications and everything. So it was just a different, two different situations yeah. And, um, but both ended up that we didn't go through with it for whatever reason, but Mm -hmm. it was our personal choice. Yeah. So you just spoke about the the physical toll. What has been the physical, um, psychological impact on all of this? Oh my gosh. Uh, personally for me, it broke, it broke me more than anything has ever broken me in my life. And it did it over and over and over again. It, um, I mean, when you get to a point where you've had so many miscarriages and you get pregnant and you say, oh, I'm pregnant. Mm -hmm. Something is wrong. Yeah. And that's where I was. I was Mm -hmm. like, oh, I'm pregnant. I knew it wasn't going to last. Mm -hmm. And so every time I got pregnant, it was, it was a burden. I was like, great. How long is this one going to last? Am I going to have to have a DNC? I mean, this is going to be terrible when, I mean, should I, and I got to the point where I didn't even tell my husband the last few times that I was pregnant. Why, why do I need to bring him into the turmoil? That is me. That's Mm -hmm. what I always took on. It's me. It's my fault. This, he's not a father because of me, you know? And, um, it, mentally, I didn't realize how much I needed help until I had hit rock bottom. I thought I was doing fine Mm -hmm. because, you know, and I would put a smile on my face. Um, when I would go to family functions and there were kids there or someone announced a pregnancy, you know, the whole shock, Oh, you're pregnant. (laughs) So great. And then Mm -hmm. you get in the car and you cry all the way home. Mm -hmm. Um, I would prepare myself to go out of the house And I had to prepare myself for triggers. And it wasn't until this year. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that and I'm lying now because I just thought to myself, no, you still prepare yourself for triggers. I do. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that if that will ever go away, Mm -hmm. but I don't do it as much Mm -hmm. as I used to. Um, It got to be so bad that I didn't want to leave my house. Mm -hmm. So I lost friendships, um, family members, you know, thought I was like stuck up or what, what was wrong with me, you know, that sort of, but I didn't want to go out and have to experience other people sharing their joy. It hurt too much. Mm-hmm. Um, mentally, I was a complete mess. I would put a smile on my face, even for my husband. So here's an example. Because I, my husband has a very stressful job and he has to be very focused in it. So I kept as much as I could on myself and didn't share a lot with him just Mm -hmm. to help lighten the burden a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so what I would do is, is I realized that if I was going to keep our marriage together, because it got really hard a lot of the time, um, that I was going to have to be happy because I was so sad all the time that it, I mean, he was sad too, but I was just so sad. I couldn't Mm -hmm. laugh. Sometimes he would look over at me and he goes, it's okay to smile. Mm -hmm. 
But then I would smile inside. I would be crying Mm -hmm. and I would have to smile really quickly and bring the smile back down because otherwise tears were going to fall. I mean, it was, it was horrible. Mm -hmm. But what I would do is, is I would smile and be happy and, and, um, tell my husband, you know, have a good day. We'll see you when you get home. Is this a normal day? Do you have any meetings or anything? And he would walk out the door and then I would sit on the floor and cry Mm -hmm. and I'd Mm -hmm. get it all out, all out, all out. And then by the time he got home, I'd put my mask on again and I'd be happy. What do you want for dinner? Okay. So this is what happened today. Whatever, you know, we'd catch up Mm -hmm. and that's what I would do. That's how mentally disturbed I was because I felt like I had to pretend in my own home. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I had so many examples. I could talk to you all day of all the crazy stuff that I did, but it was because I was broken and I was trying to spare everyone else. Mm -hmm. I was trying to save my marriage because I felt like it it could have gone to the wayside because of all the depression I was experiencing. I was just trying, 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 you know? So how were you able to turn that around? So you didn't have to wear the mask anymore. I'm still doing, I'm still figuring that out. So, Mm -hmm. um, I went to see way later in our experiences, um, after, let's see, it was like 2018. I went to see, uh, a therapist that a friend had, um, recommended to me Mm -hmm. and I only saw him like a handful of times, but he gave me a really good perspective. I had to change my perspective on things. Mm -hmm. And once I realized that, because it happened so quickly for me that um, he pointed out that I wasn't the weak, worthless, despicable, pathetic person that Mm -hmm. I went and Cause I gave him a list of all the, he's like, tell me how you feel about yourself. I had already made a list in my phone and I just Mm -hmm. read it off. You know, Mm -hmm. I'm despicable. I'm worthless. I'm pathetic. I have no, what am I here for? I have no purpose, you know, all of these things. And, um, but once he helped me change my perspective on myself to see that, no, 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 you're not worthless. You're not weak. What you've done is you've persevered. And you're so strong that you wanted to hold all of it for everyone. Yeah. And mm-hmm. even you, the strongest person, you know, mm-hmm. gave in and you might be bro- bent, but you're not broken. Absolutely. And when he was telling me all these things, I was like, I found my backbone again, mm-hmm. but it didn't happen overnight. It's, yeah. it's probably been since. So 2018 is 2021 now. So I'm still getting to the point where I'm finding my voice to say, no, Mm -hmm. I don't like that. And Mm -hmm. it wasn't until 2020, like during COVID time, there was an um, experience that I had where um, I I didn't want to go to one of my family members gatherings. Um, It was... I said, no, I don't, I I don't want to go there. And my husband got really upset Mm -hmm. and I said, you know, I'm not going anywhere anymore where I don't feel comfortable Mm -hmm. and you can go alone, but I'm not going. Mm -hmm. And he, oh, he got so mad at me. But Mm -hmm. then I thought to myself, no, you've got to stay in your ground and you cannot keep putting yourself in these positions Mm -hmm. where you, people are saying things to you and you feel like you can't say anything back. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I started, it, that was the first little thing. I was like, all right, no, I'm not going where I don't feel comfortable. Um, when someone says something to me that I don't like, mm-hmm. it's not a right back at you kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's a, I try to teach them because it's their ignorance that causes them to make these comments mm-hmm. like, why don't you just adopt? Yeah. Mm, you know, it's yeah. an ignorant person who says that to someone, mm-hmm. especially someone going through what we've been through. Yeah. You don't say that. And it sounds easy, but they don't know the process. They don't know the ideas. They don't know the feelings, all the things. Right. Mm-hmm. So instead of lashing out at them now, I'll say, you know, it would have been better had you framed, reframed the way that that came out. Mm-hmm. 
and said it maybe like this, and I'll give them an, an example. But I'm no longer accepting hateful, short, ignorant, mm -hmm. and even sometimes stupid comments. I'm just not doing it. And then whenever I feel like I don't want to be someplace, I leave. Mm -hmm. Good for you. Good and for it, you. it's just these little these little tidbits or nuggets of taking my power back. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not doing that anymore. I've held everyone's pain. And yeah. now I'm saying, here, take that back because you know, mm -hmm. I'm tired and I'm yeah. starting to wake up and here, here you go. Mm -hmm. I'm getting my energy back. No more. Yes. So. Love yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Well, you were talking about um, the 11 miscarriages. You mentioned the um, a term DNC. What is that? So um, I'll have to actually look up what the actual term is because I forget what that is now. But what's when they they go, the doctor goes in and uh, removes what's there, what's left over in your womb oh. from the pregnancy. Okay. Sometimes if you're so if you're too far along, then you can't your body can't break down what's left mm -hmm. and you have to have it removed. Oh, okay, D and DNC diet dilation and coterage. Yeah, there you go. Okay, all right. Okay. Um, knowing what you know now, what piece of advice would you give to your twenty-year-old self? Oh gosh, I would tell her so many things that I would say. You've got to learn to let go. Mm -hmm. You can't control everything, and. By trying to, you're only going to cause more pain. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what, so infertility taught me so, so many things, but that's a big one for me is I had to let go of the control. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You mentioned the terms that you gave yourself at the therapist. What, what are three terms that you would call yourself now? Oh, mm. Oh, well, shoot. Uh, I am, I'm a survivor. Mm -hmm. I am, uh, I am determined mm -hmm. and I am powerful. Absolutely. Great. Great. So what brings you happiness now? You know, it's, um, mm -hmm. it's just little things. Like mm -hmm. I taught myself to knit. I mm -hmm. like knitting now. Oh my mm -hmm. gosh. Um, I love beautiful, here's the thing. Infertility taught me to appreciate things that I never looked at before. Mm -hmm. um, so now I love beautiful days where I just sit and let the sun hit me in the face. And I will literally say to myself, oh, thank you. Thank you for that. That's so mm -hmm. nice. That feels mm -hmm. so good. Mm -hmm. You know, um, since I haven't been able to be with friends for a while, so I have been really focusing on building myself back up. Like mm -hmm. I, we were just speaking about, mm -hmm. I love learning. And, um, so I am actually a former teacher. I have a master's in literacy and I taught kindergarten for 15 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and now I tutor some kids. Mm -hmm. Um, but what I love most is learning. So mm -hmm. anything that I can do to experience new things, I am taking courses now to be a life and health coach. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I, that's another thing that brings me joy is be, being able to help people, mm -hmm. you know, seeing that look on their face when you've given them information and they're like, oh, that could work. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, give this a shot and then let me know how that goes. And when that mm -hmm. works for you, mm -hmm. I'll tell you something else, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I always say that with or without children, our life still has meaning and purpose. And of course, I like I always say, motherhood does not equate womanhood. No. So have you been able to figure out your life's purpose? Yes. Okay. I, yes. Um, when I was writing my book, it, it occurred to me because as I was able to look back, I saw patterns throughout the book and I started to see this, this is what I'm supposed to do. I was supposed to experience this so that I could experience everything mm -hmm. and then go help other people. So that's what I'm doing now. My mm -hmm. purpose 
is to share my experience and teach others how to turn their pain into power, which is my platform on my Instagram page. Um, you, you have a website called Inconceivable Turning Pain into Power. Uh huh. Tell us a little about that. So what I'm doing is, is I'm going through, basically I'm going through my book and anything that pops up about feelings or thoughts or, or things that I've learned or things that were said to me, and this is what I did to make it better. Or, um, this is how I coped during, you know, holidays, anything that I can help someone get through this with, mm -hmm. that's what I'm putting it on there. That's what my whole website's about. It's, um, it's called inconceivable. It's inconceivable dash pain to power.com. And, um, I just post everything that I've learned on there. And then if someone else shares something with me that I haven't shared yet, then I will put that on there. But mm -hmm. I, um, it's all about me. My husband kind of wants to stay out of it. So I don't mention him too much. Mm -hmm. Um, but but that's it. I'm going to help people turn their pain into power. That is my purpose. That's wonderful. And your story is definitely going to be someone else's survival guide, Dana. And I appreciate you for sharing your story. And it's just definitely going to help so many. Um, do you have any last words? Um, last words. I know I can say this. If there were somebody in front of me sitting on the bathroom floor, looking at a, a negative pregnancy test, like I did so many times, I would say, this is not your whole life. This is just a simple piece of your life. So mm -hmm. look at it. If you can look at your life on a timeline, this is a tiny dot of your entire life. So as much as this is killing you now, and I'm not going to say, don't let it kill you, let it. Mm -hmm. I would say one of the most important things I learned was you've got to face your fear. You've mm -hmm. got to face it. You've got to let that feeling move through you and not stop it. Yeah. So when you're on that bathroom floor and you're crying over a negative pregnancy test, you cry and you mm -hmm. get upset and you get angry and you blame whoever you have to blame, yeah. but let it move all the way through you. Don't try mm -hmm. and stop it. Mm -hmm. And you will have better days. I promise. Well, that's a great wrap up. And I thank you again. And I will talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Childless woman, you're beautiful. Child free woman, you are enough. This journey might not be easy, but we're in this together so we can get through this together by owning our voice. Thank you for your time and attention today. Please like, subscribe, share, and download this episode. From Tudum Global, I'm your host, Joby Tyson. See you next time on As Told by Childless Women. To support this series, please visit astoldbychildlesswomen.com.